as a result of a, a so-called blue wave that happened in November, beginning of November during this election, which really was not that much of a blue wave. The, the, the Democrats recovered the House, but they really did not uh, seize back the three chambers of government, as uh, somebody would say, uh, to the degree that the Democrats would have wanted as an, you know, they wanted an overwhelming statement that the country was tired of the Trump agenda, of the Republican Party, of, uh, I guess, the corporate uh, fossil fuel agenda, or and that, those are the things that they say that they want. But in reality, they are the most insincere party that you could hope for to be in the opposition. And I think that no example provides a better picture of this than my own uh, local representative, Marsha Fudge, who is, in my opinion, you know, she, she was basically going to fail off of her. Uh, the reason that the Democrats were so dissatisfied is because they know, they, they know this is, this is something that is uh, evident from all these communications in the media. They are fully aware of that the next two years with Nancy Pelosi or whoever is going to be the House Speaker, it's going to be very difficult for them because they are a divided party. It's no longer the party that won the House under George Bush when Pelosi was kind of the representative of, of new leadership, at least, even if she had, she'd been in Congress, I think, for over 20 years at the time. They were, they are now basically divided between uh, gradually just um, dying old wing that's symbolized by Pelosi and a more energized but less coherent youth wing as represented, represented by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So to show you just how in disingenuous Marsha Fudge is, um, there's a story that's been breaking out more on the local level than the national level. Nobody's really, I haven't really heard a lot of discussion about this, but this is Marsha Fudge today, or, or yesterday rather, in response to sp speculation that she could be Speaker of the House. Now, to understand why I, I would oppose Marsha Fudge, who's been a Democrat here for, for years. Now, I, I don't expect the people of, of, of Northeast Ohio to elect somebody who who's basically like that Dan Crenshaw guy, you know, this this white dude with uh, an eye patch or whatever. I expect them to, to elect somebody who represents the people here, represents their interests, represents their community, uh, whether it's a black woman, whether it's, uh, you know, somebody who's, uh, you know, we have a lot of Irish people here. There's a lot of successful Irish American politicians here. Now, unfortunately, all of these people who represent those communities here have come together and created a web of corruption because they all happen to be from the same party. It doesn't matter what background they are. They could be, you know, we have a, a large Puerto Rican community here. I don't think that they're that involved in politics. We have a large Ukrainian community here. The same thing. We have, we have a lot of Croatians in, in uh, Northeast Ohio. We have a lot of people from you know, from, from uh, you know, Ch Chinese Americans. We have we have a, a very diverse, a very diverse uh, demographic here in, in Northeast Ohio. But for some reason, the political system just seems to be divided between the same old families, the same groups of people. And Marsha Fudge, I like to keep this around because this was her mailer during the election. Marsha Fudge promised to keep re-elect her, and on the backside, there, there's nothing. It's just the Postal information. It doesn't have any of her accomplishments, any bills that she sponsored. And this is the person they want to make Speaker of the House. So let's hear her. I know you're, yeah. you're encouraged by the support. Is there a sense of how much support you do have? Is this putting a lot of your... I, I can't CDC even sleep. My phone is going off so much. Not just from people within this institution, but people outside of this institution who are excited about the possibility of change and new leadership. I mean, I'm hearing it from lobbyists, from labor, from tons and tons of people. And so there's a great deal of hope and excitement about the fact that there could be new leadership. I want to be real clear about this one thing. 
Nancy Pelosi was a very, very good leader and is a very good leader. I don't ever want anybody to go away and think that this is a personal issue, that she's not, because she's very good at what she does. I told her I'm going home for Thanksgiving and talk with my family and then I will have a decision. Did she ask you not to run? No. What she asked me was um, basically how we could get to a point where I could be supportive. Is there anything that you need specifically from her? To, or do you have, did you walk in with any well, ask We talked about else? some succession planning. We talked about some other things. Um, I think that the biggest issue that we discussed was the feeling in the caucus of people who are feeling left out and left behind. And so that was my biggest thing. I'm an advocate for the members of this caucus, as well as I'm an advocate for the American people. So I just want to be sure that we are moving the caucus in a direction that the American people would see it go, and that members of our caucus would feel good about it. Cleaning floors with a mop and bucket is a hassle. Okay, so, sorry about that, but I didn't hit the button in time. Uh, in any case, in, in no Swiffer WetJet makes cleaning easy. Rambling conversation that they talk all about policies. Uh, if you guys want some uh, Swiffer or whatever the hell that is, you know, go ahead. But <laughs> in any case, uh, Marsha Fudge and Nancy Pelosi are fighting over what? Over who's going to be leader? But to lead, to lead where? You know, the Democratic, the Democratic Party, I'm sorry to tell you guys, does not have a vision and does not have an alternative that's really coherent to the Republicans. Yes, they, they have they have the issue of not being Republicans of not paying Donald Trump, but they, you know, in reality, they are, they, they do the same thing. They always end up authorizing massive defense appropriations bills. They always end up authorizing a lot of uh, wasteful government spending. Just, it's, it's, it's different public, wasteful public spending than the Republicans. It's, it's, um, you know, some, in some cases it is the same. It's just, it's a slight, it's a slight adjustment of the dial. You know, you have, sorry, it's the reverse on the screen. So it's left, right dial, but it's, it's a slight adjustment. It's not, it's not the drastic adjustment that people think. And that's why I believe we do need more parties, both on the left and the right. So the fact is that, um, this is the Washington Examiner, which is not, it's not sympathetic news source for Marsha Fudge, but they, they talk about this issue, which has been floating around here in the, in Cleveland and the Northeast Ohio community for a few days now, which is that Marsha Fudge signed a letter with a number of other local Democratic politicians in support of Judge Lance Mason. So I'll show you, here's a story, Lance Mason. So this, this is, uh, this is kind of, it does piss me off, okay? I'm not going to pretend this is funny. Uh, but but it's it's kind of ridiculous how this keeps happening. The only thing, the funny thing is that things like this keep happening in, in Northeast Ohio because people are fine. People say as long as somebody does not get arrested for something violent, then a politician should, should continue to be trusted and, and given another chance. We used to have a person who was on Cleveland City Council, uh, who, whose name was uh, Zach Reed, who kept getting popped for DUIs over and over again. And each time he would say, well, you know, this is another chance I want. I've done so much help help for the community and everything. And Zach Reed was a little more, um, you know, a little more of a mover than the rest of the establishment leadership, including the mayor, Mayor Jackson. But the fact, the fact is that he just kept getting arrested for DUIs. So... And here, I can't believe there's zero comments, but um, it says Lance Mason's wife told the judge who sentenced him that she feared his rep retribution absent aggressive treatment. So Lance Mason had been convicted in 2014. He was a, a local common police judge of beating his wife very violently, and he ended up serving one year in prison. And that's what we're going to be talking about for most of today's video. It says Aisha Fraser Mason wrote in a 2015 email to alerted the judge who would sentence her husband, Lance Mason, to prison for brutalizing her in front of her children. 
So he was beating her in front of her children, that she feared Mason could seek retribution against her unless he underwent aggressive counseling and supervision upon his release. I feel there is a possibility that Lance may retaliate against me if he is not properly treated and supervised upon release following his incarceration period. Fraser Mason wrote in the email to Judge Patricia Cosgrove. Uh, Aisha Mason, by the way, was a, she was an elementary school teacher at a local a local school district here, Shaker Heights, where I actually did go to Shaker Heights for part of my elementary school. So this is this is, um, and I know people who who you know I only went there for a couple of years, but I know people who went there and they they had her as their as their math teacher and stuff like that. And um, yeah, it is you know they should be pissed off. This this is a big issue when a woman is married to a local judge and was beaten. Uh, in front of her kids, and the guy only got one year because he happened to be a common police judge. My desire is to see him have extensive aggressive counseling so that he can understand how to treat me slash women. Cleveland.com obtained a copy of the email on Wednesday just before Mason was booked into Shaker Heights City Jail and held without bond as a suspect in Fraser Mason's fatal Saturday stabbing. The message, which until Wednesday was kept private, brings in an ineluctable focus, Fraser Mason's fear over her then-husband's ability to, to deal with anger and willingness to get help, and stands in stark contrast to letters written by influential judges, politicians, and lawyers who insisted that Mason was not a violent person and that the attack was a one-off incident unlikely to be repeated. So this was not a one-off incident, by the way. It was a pattern of... Um, of domestic abuse against his wife uh, and it was in front of the children too, which is, it's not okay. I don't think, I think I, I have a pretty, you know, <laughs> low moral bar for what I, you know, I'm, I'm not against, I, I don't think people that that are drug abusers should be thrown in, thrown in prison. I don't think gambling should be illegal. I don't think porn should be illegal. Um, I'm not, I'm not like trying to enforce all of these uh, laws against sexual morality, you know, in terms of, you know, the, the gay people or whatever. Those people, I don't really care what they do as long as they don't bother me. You know, I think I think that this, however, is something that people should probably be able to agree on, that you don't beat your spouse in front of your kids. Um, Fraser Mason sent the email days before Cosgrove sentenced Mason to prison for two years after he pleaded guilty to attempted felonious assault domestic violence charges for beating his wife so badly she needed fix. So I thought it was one year. Um, oh, okay. So here. So so badly she needed facial reconstruction surgery on August 2nd, 2014. Fraser Mason wrote in the email that she did not want the letter read aloud to Mason's at Mason's sentencing hearing, but one Cosgrove to consider it. Ten months later, in June 2016, Cosgrove approved Mason's request for early release and placed him on probation for five years under the supervision of the Lorraine County Adult Probation Department, which is run by the Lorraine County Common Police Court. So Lorraine is the county that's west of ours. It's, it's kind of a steelwork country. Cosgrove could not be reached for comment Wednesday, but she told WKYC Channel 3 that Fraser Mason did not oppose her husband's early release at the time, citing financial strain. Then Cuyahoga County Prosecutor, Timothy J. McGinney's office also wrote in court filings that it did not object to Mason's early release as long as Cosgrove ordered him to get a job, pay full child support, and complete anger management counseling. Uh, yeah, so the prosecutor, not the not the wife, uh, but but okay, so Fraser Mason did not object oppose her husband's early release, citing financial strain. So maybe she maybe she needed the the income from child support because she now probably had to subsist on the, on the salary of, of one teacher, which by the way, I, I don't know how much teachers make in Shaker Heights. I'm, I'm assuming it's not, it's not nothing, but who's to say how much they were making before that when he was a practice, when he was a serving judge. Cosgrove didn't, did impose those orders. She barred Mason from having contact with Fraser Mason directly or indirectly ordered him to withdraw money from his pension to pay $22,000 in child support he owed at the time and ordered him to complete a counseling program dealing with anger management and emotional issues, including any issues involving paranoia or depression at the direction of the probation department. According to her June 
27, 2016 order. Records show that she held two hearings on Matt Mason's compliance with terms of his probation after his release, both within three months of his release. So that that's that's enough about the case. I think we've established the fact of the case. The, the guy went to prison for a year. He, he had beaten his wife. But the fact is that now, now she is, she's been murdered, stabbed to death in her home. And it turns out that Marsha Fudge, the congresswoman here, she is basically... You know, <laughs> she, she's basically uh, been exposed. It says, and back in 2015, Judge Def Fudge defended former Ohio Judge Lance Mason, writing a letter in support of leniency after he was accused of physically abusing his wife, Aisha Fraser. <coughs> in the letter, Fudge wrote that then Cuyahoga County Common Police Judge Mason was a good man who made a very bad mistake. So she's saying this about a person who admitted to beating his wife so badly that she did facial reconstruction surgery in front of her kids, in front of their kids. Okay, on Saturday, Mason was taken into custody by police again and charged with stabbing Fraser to death. In 2015, Mason took a plea deal, reducing eight charges, including felonious assault, kidnapping, and endangering children to a domestic violence charge and felonious assault. Fudge's letter in support of Mason helped him secure an early release over a year shy of his 24-month prison sentence. In response to Mason's recent arrest, Fudge released a statement saying, My heart breaks for Aisha Fraser. I pray for Aisha's family, especially her children, as they attempt to deal with this tragedy. My support of Matt of Lance in 2015 was based on the person I knew for almost 30 years, an accomplished lawyer, prosecutor, state legislator, and a judge. That's a Lance Mason I supported. The person who committed these crimes is not the Lance Mason familiar to me. It was a horrific crime, and I and everyone who knew Aisha are mourning her loss. In the Me Too era, where men and women have faced a reckoning from victims and survivors, covering for an, admit an admitted domestic abuser can be perceived as more harmful than the act of violence itself. For Fudge, this is pretty damning. Whether Fudge remain decides to remain in Congress, it's difficult to imagine that she will have any shot of taking the gavel away from Pelosi now. So I, I think it's, it's pretty sad. It's pretty sad that, first of all, the Washington Examiner, um, let me see here. So the, the Washington Examiner was basically saying that this endangers her career in Congress. But I, I can tell you from my personal experience that I don't think it's really going to affect this at all, affect that at all. She's going to continue to be in the House She's going to continue to be reelected because people here don't care. They'll reelect people no matter what, so long as they get the endorsement of all the other county and state officials for the Democratic Party. It's basically a machine here. The democracy is kind of a joke in Northeast Ohio. Uh, we don't get a real choice between candidates. Sometimes in the primaries, too, when there's an open seat, they're basically, you, you know, the, the, one family will basically wait till till the last moment to enter one of their people in it, and then everybody else has to get on board with them, and it's it's ridiculous. You know, there's the, the Coyne family here, there's the O'Malley family, there is the, I think the Corgan family, I believe, also has has a, a lot of influence here. That a lot of, a lot of like, well-known Irish names here in the area. Uh, they can't, especially for judicial picks over here. That's why I don't really vote in these stupid judge races. So, yeah, th this, is, this is, this is not going to derail her local political career, but it will do on the, on the national level. No, I don't think she's going to be able to beat Nancy Pelosi by any stretch of the imagination. She's probably, she's probably got zero chance of actually winning the speaker seat. If she ever did, I think that floating the name of Marsha Fudge was basically a cop out by the democratic party to try to tell people, Oh, well, we, we might be changing out. And everything, you know, we might we might actually uh, do something different. When in reality, they don't have any intention of changing anything. This is this is uh, Marsha Fudge's Twitter feed, and you can see some people are actually pretty. So this is her attacking Betsy DeVos. Um, <coughs> um, so this is. This is some, uh, I don't know exactly what the story is about. Maybe she's right, maybe she's wrong. 
but a lot of people are ranking her over the coals. So you, they, these got hidden, but these are people that actually hate Donald Trump, and they're not they're not hardcore Republicans, but they say Lance. Lance Mason, your buddy, still not the guy you know. Terrible blood on your hands. Okay, this person says you advocated for the domestic abuser and now murderer. The evidence was clear in the first case, and still you said this wasn't the man you knew. Yeah, abusers hide their evil. This is atrocious, and I hope you're voted out. <coughs> this person, foster for a baby mom. Not good choice supporting a man who committed a horrific domestic violence against his wife and then killed her over the victim. I would suggest you go to a support group for education at Nancy Pelosi. So maybe this might just be people cucking for Nancy Pelosi or uh, basically, you know, you can see that this person has a Women's March logo. So we're going to talk about the Women's March as well in a, few, in a couple minutes. It says, what have the Democrats done about any of the, so that, that's, that's something different. Um, there's more of these. For some reason, Twitter hides these. But this one, who's called, their name is Fuck Trump and MAGA assholes go away. He says, just found out you're the twat and that thought it was a good idea to let a woman be her who's now a murderer out free. Way to go. go. Hope you burn in hell. Uh, let's see if there's any more responses to this. So, the, so Marsha Fudge is the most well-known congresswoman. Uh, she ended up, by the way, supporting Nancy Pelosi. In the end, possibly because the story broke. Uh, how do you feel since the man you supported murdered his wife? You stood up for him after he abused her. Now she's dead. Uh, this person, why in the world would you support the early release of a man who beat his wife? And yeah, the, there's there's people who the, Marsha Fudge is empty. There's nothing there's nothing that she's ever done for this for. Any, she, she was the mayor of a local city here that's basically a mess, Warrensville Heights. And she's um, just, there, there's, like I said, this postcard says everything. This is her mailer, and it, on the other side, it doesn't have anything. It doesn't have any accomplishments, nothing. It, it just doesn't, who, who cares? Why, why would I support somebody who can't even produce any anything for her own election uh, mailers in order to convince people to vote. So that's not the only issue going on. That's, you know, th there's a similar issue here. Now, now the root also took Marsha Fudge to task. Uh, we'll just read that. And um, in response to that, when the local news outlet asked Fudge for comments on, on the letter, the de Democratic off Congresswoman offered this statement. My heart breaks for Aisha Fraser. I pray for Aisha's family especially her children, as they attempt to deal with this tragedy. So I think, I think this is the statement we previously read. If that's what Marsha Fudge has to say about Aisha Fraser, she can keep it. She can keep her prayers, and she can keep her prayers for Aisha's children, who has had witnessed Judge Lance Mason's attacks on their mother, presumably for years. It is necessary here to be clear exactly about what exactly Judge Mason did to Aisha Fraser. It's necessary here to be clear about the facts of this case. Facts Fudge understood it and knew to be true when she wrote her letter of support for a friend in 2015. From Slate, he punched her 20 times, bit her, and slammed her head against the dashboard of the car. In the Oh, I forgot it was in the car. I remember this now. And the window, breaking a bone in her face and leaving her in need of facial reconstruction surgery. She attempted to flee the car. He continued to beat her before driving away and leaving her on the road to flag down a passing car and asked for a ride to the hospital. Their two young daughters were sitting in the back of the car during the assault. But Fudge claimed then and claims now that this person, a person who is now accused of stabbing his wife to death after serving just nine months, in, so it wasn't even a year in prison, is someone she, do, she doesn't know. The person Fudge knew, her dear friend, was an accomplished lawyer, prosecutor, state legislator, and judge. As if abusers couldn't be any of those things, as if abusers can't be what they are, Human beings with a range of gifts and characteristics, some of them good. So, no, this is, this is um, I mean, I guess I, we should get, um, give them credit, the root for at least calling the, these people out. Uh, <coughs> here it says, when Mason got a job as city director of minority business following his brief stint in prison, some speculated that Fudge may have had some influence on the decision. She and Mayor Frank Jackson have denied this. So, there's another detail that I, I, I forgot to, to, to mention. 
after Lance Mason got out of prison, Mayor Jackson actually gave him a job, uh, which I, I don't even know if the job existed before, uh, with the city. You know, and, and this is a major position. Most people don't even get to, you know, you need, you need like a long record in order to get into local government in, in, in some parts of the country. Here in, here in Ohio, you just need to know the right people. Still, Mason's supporters pointed to his apparent contrition, and as Slate notes, the prosecutor in his case called Mason's spousal abuse an example of some, sometimes how good pe people make bad decisions. Today, Aisha Fraser is dead, and the evidence suggests that she is not dead as a consequence of a bad decision, but because of an abuser and the people that enabled him along the way. That's exactly right. I, I can't believe I'm arguing, I'm, I'm agreeing with the root, this Anne Brannigan woman. Um, So, yeah, there's a lot of commenters here. Uh, it's, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty consistent in my opinion. Uh, so, the Women's March, they're also going through a bad period right now. Women's March founder calls for co-chairs to resign over hateful racist rhetoric. Uh, the original founder of the Women's March, Teresa Shook, demanded that the organization's four co-chairs Linda Sarsour, Carmen Perez, Tamika Mallory, and Bob Bland stepped down for allowing anti-Semitism, anti-LBGTQ, whatever, salmon and hateful racist rhetoric to become part of the organization's platform. In a Facebook post published Monday afternoon, Shook wrote that the four public faces of the Women's March should resign because they have strayed from the group's goals. I have waited, hoping they would right the ship, but they have not, Shook wrote. In opposition to our unity principles, they have allowed anti-Semitism any LGBTQIA sentiment and hateful racist rhetoric to become part of the platform by their refusal to separate themselves from groups that espouse these racist, hateful beliefs. Shook, a retired attorney who resides in Hawaii, sparked the 2017 Women's March on Washington with a single Facebook post. With her bland <laughs> Vanessa, Vanessa Vrubel and Evie Harmon are credited with founding the march, which took shape after Donald Trump's election. Mallory Sarsour and Perez were brought on later to serve as national co-chairs alongside Bland to ensure the organization had diverse leadership. So, so this is this is talking about the original Women's March, you know, the the founding principles. And you know, I, I've always laughed at the Women's March. I think it's a preposterous idea. I think that women's rights haven't been changed very much, whether between Donald Trump and and Barack Obama, or, or between Barack Obama and, and President Bush, I think that it's usually the court systems and the legislatures that are really the key, not so much the presidency. But, I mean, you're free to disagree. But the initial people who supported, who, who, who founded the Women's March included the, uh, Bob Bland. I don't know why. So that's, that's her over here, this white woman. And three other white women. And they decided, because they're so insecure, that they needed a, a group of diverse women. So they picked Tamika Mallory, who had been a Joe Biden aide, Linda Sarsour, who we know enough about, and Carmen Perez, who I don't really know much about, to be the co-chairs. And, and basically, they've, they've turned the movement into kind of a, a running joke and consistently alienated more and more of the members who... Uh, are, are, are shocked sometimes by the ridiculous tone deafness of their statements. I call for the current co-chairs to step down and to let others lead uh, who can restore faith in the movement and its original intent, Shook continued. I stay in solidarity with all the sister march organizations to bring the movement back to its authentic purpose. The organization came under fire this year when Mallory was spotted in an event hosted by Louis Farrakhan, the leader of the religious group the Nation of Islam, who has a history of making anti-Semitic and anti-gay remarks. The day Mallory attended the event, Farhan delivered a three-hour speech in which he said, the powerful Jews are his enemy. Mallory later posted an Instagram video and a photo of herself at the event praising Farhan. Mallory explained her ties to Farhan in a News 1 essay, writing that she began attending Nation of Islam events when her son's father was slain 17 years ago. So this is not somebody who recently discovered the group or has no no um, conscious. This is this is basically somebody who's been involved in the group for years, 
and she's fully aware. By the way, I've, I've said, and I've, I've made video after video about Farrakhan, that I don't believe he should be censored. I think he should be given the same First Amendment rights as everyone else. But, but, you, you have to understand that Louis Farrakhan's racism and, and bigotry is not just towards Jew, Jewish or white people or, or um, uh, it, it, he, he says a lot of derogatory things about women, about Mexicans, about Arabs, by the way. So those people saying that Louis Farrakhan is, is only the Zionists or whatever, or, or, or the, the white man who's... A, no, the man is basically, uh, you know, he just hates people. What do you want? He's allowed to hate people, but he, he's one of the most hateful people that you can find on the Internet. And, and you know, let's just, let's just admit that. You know, we don't have to tell people to shut up in order to recognize who they are. And to understand what they're saying, the real Louis Farrakhan is a hateful person, and I, I think he has the right to be hateful. But you can't found a movement that's that's against hate that also supports Louis Farrakhan or or accept support from him. The organizers responded to Shook on a, in a Monday Facebook post, thanking Shook for her work, but saying she had irresponsibly commented on the matter. Today, Teresa Shook weighed in irresponsibly as of other organizations attempting in this moment to take advantage of our growing pains to try and fracture our network, the Post says. Reads, we are imperfect, we don't know everything, and we have caused harm. At times we have responded with hurt, but we are committed to learning, the Post continued. <coughs> we are grateful for people who have been with us for the past few years, wrestling with the challenges and opportunities of what we are trying to build. Our ongoing work speaks for itself. That's our focus, not armchair critiques from those who want to take credit for our labor. So our sir added her thought, own thoughts in an essay published Monday, writing that Shook suddenly called for the Women's March to denounce Farrakhan because of last month's mass shooting at the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh. The horrific Tree of Life shooting happened that took the life of three of 11 innocent Jewish Americans, and all of a sudden Women's March was being asked to condemn the minister Farrakhan. There was nothing new that happened between Women's March and the minister. Folks decided to rehash eight months ago. So no, th this is this is what's what's so ridiculous. Okay, people were saying this. People were saying this back in February, March, that the, the Women's March is corrupted by this contradictory message where they support they support they, they oppose hate, they oppose bigotry, and yet at least two of the members, and I think Carmen Perez might also be one have been publicly out there supporting Louis Farrakhan. You cannot have it both ways. It's it's either one or the other. So Louis Farrakhan is, whatever you think about his views, and I, I, I've never opposed him, I, I oppose him, but I've never opposed people uh, going to his events or listening to his lectures or anything, but uh, you cannot <coughs> suddenly say, well, uh, it's only because of the Tree of Life shooting that people are making a big stink about Louis Farrakhan. No, there, there was a lot of talk about this for months, and people were. This is, and, and finally, this is what's wrong about Teresa Shook's statement that she, that it took her so long to do this, and we don't even know if she was doing anything behind the scenes because I believe that this woman, this woman who is basically. Um, so insecure that she had to go out and look for somebody like Linda Sarsour to begin with in order to lead her movement. She's so insecure and so so, so um, uh, just ashamed of her own white heritage that she needs somebody like Linda Sarsour or Tamika Mallory in order to lead the movement because she can't think of, she, she's afraid somebody like her will be perceived as too privileged to, to lead an opposition quote-unquote resistance movement. It's her fault because she let these people take what she thought was a noble effort and just corrupt it completely. She reiterated, this is Linda Sarsour again, that the Women's March rejects all forms of anti-Semitism and racism, adding, we have been clear that Minister Farrakhan has said hateful and hurtful things and that he does not align with our unity principles of the Women's March that were created by women of color. No, they haven't been clear. In fact, Tamika Mallory has said before that she, she does not um, renounce so that's that's bullshit. <laughs> so you have people here in the chat just uh, going after each other. Uh, someone said anyone who associates themselves or allows themselves to be represented by Linda Sarsour is complete slime. And this person said, "Do you support racists and homophobes? Why are you mad at this?" And 
this guy and the first person said, Michael says, you don't know anything about who I, or what I support. And the other person says, Joseph says, are you not a conservative? And Michael says, no, I refuse to identify with nor support any group, including conservatives. I don't believe in groupthink. I prefer, prefer individualism. And then people start jumping onto it and saying, no, there's no such thing as individualism. You don't know, or, or, you know, it's peculiar that you call this individualism. You sound like a lot of people that I know. This is, it's standard fare from people. I get the same thing from Democrats who say, well, you, since you're criticizing us, you must be a Republican. And then when I, they, they, they never comment on posts where I attack President Bush. They never uh, comment on posts where I attack Paul Ryan. They never, they never comment on posts where I criticize and attack, you, you know, so there have been posts where I attack Donald Trump when, when, when um, he appointed, uh, what's that, uh, Rex Tillerson as Secretary of State. I said he was a horrible pick. When he appointed, when he's been talking about appointing Chris Christie, when he's been doing things like, uh, you know, appointing Jeff Sessions. Uh, when he had Brett Kavanaugh nominated to the Supreme Court, I, I said, you know, somebody, the Patriot Act guy? No, I'm not going to support Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, that doesn't mean that I supported all the crap they did against Kavanaugh. I'm just saying that, in principle, I don't think that Kavanaugh was the type of judge I would support. Th those people don't care. They'll, they'll call you, uh, people will call you whatever they want to call you in order to prove that you're on the other side. And that's the tribalism in American politics. And that's the type of thing that keeps people like Marsha Fudge getting reelected because you can't get an alternative when the establishment can just paint you as somebody who is part of the enemy, which is exactly what they, it's exactly what Nancy Pelosi is going to be able to do in order to fend off Marsha Fudge's, uh, now, not, now, now the challenge has been fended off. She's pretty much withdrawn her bid for speaker. And that's why Marsha Fudge will probably be reelected here in Ohio. So I'm sorry to say that I, I don't see any good outlook for the that I, lived in, that I live in in terms of this, uh, we're going to have to really think very hard about what to do about it, and I don't see a path forward. But in any case, please like this video, share the video, subscribe to my channel, subscribe to my second channel, Razor Ray Live Wounds, for occasional uh, live streams, and please support the Patreon below. Give me your tips if you want to give me that money, and comment when the video uploads. And have a happy Thanksgiving for you, your family, and everyone around you.